Hi, everyone here and around the world. We have good news. Earth Files has broken through 245,000 subscribers. And if you aren't subscribed, please click on the subscribe and like buttons. We really, really appreciate your support. And I think that there is one thing common to most of us gathering weekly at the Earth Files YouTube channel. We love to look at the night sky. We love to read about astronomy discoveries. And this past week, we were all stunned to learn that the universe we are in could be twice as old as astronomers once calculated. If the new research holds up, the Big Bang took place 26.7 billion years ago, not 13.8. Astronomers and physicists until now tried to figure out the age of our universe by studying the oldest known stars. But from Canada's University of Ottawa has come a new study published July 7, 2023, that proposes if an astrophysical theory called tired light is true. Light loses energy and shine after a long distance in a universe that is constantly expanding into infinity. So, quote, we can reinterpret the redshift as a hybrid of both of these phenomena, energy and shine, and thus arrive at an even more accurate age estimate of the universe, which now is 26.7 billion years, close quote. Well, this would also explain another puzzle, why the James Webb Space Telescope is showing first stars, first black holes, and very early galaxies that have advanced levels of development and mass. They are older and more evolved than astronomers ever thought possible until now. And meanwhile, back on Earth, Humans keep arguing about whether there is other intelligent life in this very old universe. Last week, Representative Tim Burchett of Tennessee announced on Twitter that, quote, the House Oversight Committee is to hold UFO hearing next Wednesday, July 26, 2023, close quote, which will be next Wednesday. The White House also followed up by announcing that it takes UFO allegations seriously. The New York Times also headlined on July 14th, quote, bipartisan measure aims to force declassification of UFO records, close quote. The article by reporter Julian Barnes states, quote, Senator Chuck Schumer of New York, the majority leader, is pushing legislation to create a commission with broad authority to declassify government documents about UFOs and extraterrestrial matters in an attempt to force the government to share all that it knows about unidentified phenomena. The Senate measure sets a 300-day deadline for government agencies to organize their records on unidentified phenomena and to provide it to the review board. It is hard to know how many unreleased documents exist in government archives, but more recent work, particularly by the Pentagon, has not been made public. Senator Schumer's office said, you now will have a process through which we will declassify this material, close quote. And tonight, I'm declassifying, with permission, a July 14th email sent to me by a man who worked at the Northrop Aircraft Division in Hawthorne, California for 28 years from 1966 to 1994. His name is Richard Engler. He was a motion picture and still photographer who was originally from Minneapolis, Minnesota. First, he worked for 10 years with the U.S. Navy's Northern Ordnance Factory where shipboard missile systems were designed and built. And that included the Terrier, Talos, Tartar, and Tassip Blue missiles. Then, in 1966, he was hired by Northrop Aircraft and B-2 Bomber Division in Hawthorne, California, 
where he worked for the next 28 years until 1994 and was presented this beautiful Northrop plaque, quote, in appreciation for your 28 years of service to Northrop Grumman Corporation. Even the world famous U.S. Air Force Thunderbirds, to honor Richard Engler's 1994 retirement, flew over him and autographed this photo, quote, to Dick Engler with sincere best wishes, the U.S. Air Force Thunderbirds, close quote. And then recently on July 14th, Richard Engler emailed me a four-page letter that included these words, quote, Northrop had many programs in work for the U.S. Air Force requiring a full-time photographer and photo lab at Edwards Air Force Base. Even so, the many projects there often required more photographic coverage. Three round-trip aircraft flights from the main plant in Hawthorne, California, to the final assembly facility in Palmdale and our Edwards Air Force Base site were standard morning, noon, and end of day for engineering and photographic personnel. Quote, it was on one of these first trips to Edwards when our man stationed there took me into the photo lab darkroom. He closed two sets of doors, a cement block room inside a room inside a room, and in almost a whisper, told me of the UFO landing on the approach of the main runway and that they had been instructed to never talk about it." Close quote. Mr. Engler told me that the UFO landing on the Edwards Air Force Base runway was also witnessed by astronaut Gordon Cooper, shown here waiting in the NASA White Room for his Mercury Atlas IX Faith 7 spacecraft to launch to the moon from the Cape Canaveral Air Force Station launch complex on May 15, 1963. That was the last Mercury mission. Fifteen years later, in November 1978, astronaut Gordon Cooper allegedly reported these words to the UN's Granada ambassador. I believe that extraterrestrial vehicles and their crews are visiting this planet from other planets, which obviously are a little more technically advanced than we are here on Earth. I did have occasion in 1951 to have two days of observation of many flights of them, of different sizes, flying in fighter formation, generally from east to west over Europe. They were at a higher altitude than we could reach with our jet fighters of that time. There are several of us who do believe in UFOs and who have had occasion to see a UFO on the ground or from an airplane, close quote. Astronaut Gordon Cooper urged Ambassador Griffith to get the United Nations to investigate UFOs, which would add credibility so more well-qualified people with UFO information might speak publicly. Well, now, it's nearly a half century later in July 2023, and humanity is waiting yet again for the powers that be to tell the whole truth about the non-human intelligences and their very advanced technologies based on Earth in our solar system and light years beyond in other solar systems and galaxies. Richard Engler began working for Northrop Aircraft Division in the Hawthorne, California region in 1966 at the age of 31, and his assignments were at Edwards Air Force Base. Edwards was built in 1933 and has been operational ever since. It is between the dry desert lake beds of Rogers and Rosamond in California's Mojave Desert, about 90 miles northeast of Los Angeles. Based at Edwards Air Force Base, running his cameras to document test flights, Richard Engler had heard a lot of whispers about UFOs and a small flying saucer landing on an Edwards Air Force Base runway. But what shocked him into conviction 
that there is technology in Earth's skies that no humans could make came after he retired. So you started work in 1966 with Northrop Aircraft Division in Hawthorne, California. That's correct. You worked at Northrop for how many years? 28 years. And in your letter to me on July 14th, you wrote, quote, By that time, I had heard of UFOs, but did not really fill my mind with the idea of their significance. What happened at Northrop that convinced you that our government, our country, was hiding UFO technology and beings? Well, one of my very first trips there, we traveled back and forth constantly, flew from Hawthorne to Edwards Air Force Base on jobs, sometimes staying for days and weeks, and sometimes just a quick trip doing something in return. I at first met the man who was running our photo operations there. He was an old-time photographer named Sam Orr, well-known in the business, a good friend of Chuck Yeager's, and Sam beckoned to me. I got something to talk about. On the ground floor was Northrop's photo lab department, and inside there was an office area, and then a cement blocked off area for dark rooms. It entails building rooms inside of rooms. And these rooms were made out of cement blocks. Sam beckoned me and I went inside the first room and then we closed that door and then opened up another door into the dark room, closed that up. I don't believe he even turned the light on. When we went into another dark room where he told me of the situation with the test pilot at that time, Gordon Cooper, running a test facility. And while his people were at the end of 04 runway doing this, a small flying saucer, their disc, came down and landed at the end of the runway. These guys were out there filming with motion pictures and still cameras. Sam ran over, set up, and shot pictures of the small flying saucer, and as they got close, it took off again. He actually didn't see it. It was seen by many others. The film that they took was processed, and on orders from higher-ups, they were told to process the film, and there would be an airplane. The film was put on, and it was flown away, never to be seen again. Sam says, when he was telling me about this, he says uh, that they had been instructed to never talk about it again. Did you ask him why? No, I didn't. He just said that was the orders. And so he was actually whispering this to me, even though we were inside two concrete block buildings. He was still very quiet and careful and whatever. This was 1966? Yes, it would have been about 1966, yes. Do you have a guess today, as we're talking in July of 2023, about the destination of the film and photographs of this craft that we did not build? Where do you think likely that it went? To the Pentagon, Wright-Patterson, what do you think? I have heard interviews with Gordon Cooper asking him what happened to it and where it went and who got it. And I can recall him saying, how the hell do I know? They put that stuff on an airplane or in a briefcase or a bag and it goes and that's the last you see of it. So Gordon Cooper had been exposed to the concept that there were UFOs not made by us from someplace else in outer space, and that he had enough exposure to know that he had either seen photos or film that disappeared, meaning that it was put on planes and went someplace and never seen again. Right, that's correct. Uh, Gordon Cooper testified before Congress on UFOs and people seeing them and everything else. And the premise of his talk was, you've got to let people know the truth. Right. 
never happened. Today, as we speak in July of 2023, with stumbling efforts in Congress to try to start having truth delivered to the public after all of these decades and not really doing it very well, what happened to you that convinced you beyond political rhetoric that something is interacting with our planet, that it has craft and technologies that we could only imagine and we cannot duplicate? Yeah, well, I retired 28 years at Northrop as a photographer, motion pictures and still photography. I worked on many top secret programs, some very strange ones. I retired. My wife was very ill, and I took care of her until she passed away. But before that happened, we had friends. He was a retired Marine Corps colonel. They were celebrating their wedding anniversary. They lived in San Diego, and we lived on the Palos Verdes Peninsula. I had two balconies that overlooked the area in the ocean and spent a lot of time out there with my telescope looking at whales and that sort of thing. We went to a dinner at one of the overwater shoreline fish restaurants, and we stood outside on the patio area, series of decks at various levels. And that was when I noticed that there wasn't a single light in the whole area. It wasn't on the beach. It wasn't on the restaurants. It wasn't on the storefronts, on the streetlights. It was totally black. And I'm looking out over the ocean between Catalina and Orange County, and I see a bright, bright light out there, which appears to be sitting on the ocean, and it started to move. It's very bright, and it's going towards the north, towards Orange County and Long Beach, and I thought, if that thing keeps going, it's going to wipe out Long Beach. And as it moved, it got bigger and brighter. The light would go out, and it would appear larger and more forward from what it was. And I can't believe what I'm looking at, even though I've seen some pretty strange things over the years. But this thing just kept going, kept getting closer and closer to the east end of the island until it got to a point where it was very, very big. And I can see that it's not in the water, but it's above the water. The, the beautiful, brilliant, whitest white light I've ever seen is shining through the tops of waves in front of it, showing this beautiful greenish color. But the thing kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and I couldn't believe what I was looking at. It got huge. It wasn't until later to compare to maps and locations how large this thing was. I don't know if it was a ball or if it was a disc or what it was, but it was round. And it was a brilliant, brilliant white light. And it moved another jump or two towards the end of the island and then blinked out and was gone. What was the diameter that you estimated it was? I estimated it was close to a mile across. I have never been able to forget that thing. And it was three miles away. And the mountain here is three miles from where I live. And using measurements, it comes up very close to being a mile across. A mile diameter craft. When did that hit you? Oh, my God. And the more you think about it, what did I see? And that humans are not making mile diameter round craft. No, they aren't. You can't believe that it's there in front of you, and yet it is a physical presence. Yes, that's a good way to put it. Everyone is afraid to talk about the truth that UFOs right. are an extraterrestrial presence on this planet and have been here not just for the 20th and the 21st centuries. People I've talked to in the government, they have been here for at least 278 million years. You're right. I totally believe that from everything I've seen. The brainwashing that's been done in our country and many places around the world is that if you see something like that, it, you didn't see it, you're crazy. How do we get past 
that old conditioning of lies and policies of denial? I don't know. Well, Representative Burchett from Tennessee has said that he has been exposed to information about an extraterrestrial civilization in which they are so advanced that what they can do versus what we can do is incomprehensible to him. They got to be working toward a point where they're going to finally be forced by so many people seeing so many things that they have to admit it. Our government has known about extraterrestrials and advanced craft since World War II, 80-some years ago. Yeah. And so why has the government of the United States kept policies of lies and denials intact going into 2023? It seems to have started back in the Truman administration. We don't want to frighten people, so we're just going to tell them they're crazy and they're seeing something. Which I think is the worst policy. Absolutely. When you can go to South America, for instance, there are hotbeds of UFO activity there, and they admit it, they see it, they talk about it, it's on the news, it's on their television, it's all over. You come to the United States and anybody who talks about it is crazy. Why do you think the United States has been the strongest suppressor of the truth that we're not alone in this universe and that other intelligences have been coming and going and basing on Earth and in this solar system, and they know that is a truth. Why the strict policies of lies and denial since World War II? I think government, they're afraid. They're afraid of losing control of people. People are going to say, we don't believe you anymore on anything. Yeah, that's the result of 80 years of lies when people in the military and aerospace have known the truth because they have worked with non-humans. We have had the craft for our human engineers to examine and do top secret work with. And therefore, after 80 years, so many people know that the policies of denial are lying about the fact that we're not alone in this universe. Yeah, these people who are all in power telling everybody, you do what I say, and you can't control it. And if they can't control it and can't tax it, what's left? What's to tell everybody you didn't see it? First, I want to say with my heart and soul that I feel like reaching out to everybody, people and animals on this planet now suffering in the awful heat. And maybe some of you listening tonight have your own Edwards Air Force Base UFO experiences or other base experiences bottled up. Well, I'm here to listen. And hopefully, if some of you have more stories and I can record, I will keep sharing back with all of you. I know that there are hundreds and hundreds of experiences. We just have to get past all of the policies of suppression and denial. And I look forward to your feedback on this interview and also want you all to know that each week's Earth Files goes to podcast on Thursdays. So we're in podcasts as well as the live shows. And Ian, What questions do you have lined up now from our viewers? Well, we thought we have had all of this solved with Ian's connection, and we've been working at it, rehearsing. Everything has gone fine. We don't know. It's it's so persistent that I sometimes wonder if somebody (laughs) keeps trying to block us. We had, we were talking, everything was fine before we went live. And we've been wrestling with this problem now. Yeah, for over a a month. 
We don't know, have an answer, but Ian is back. Okay. And I was... Yeah, I, again, I don't know what happened there. You suddenly cut out. It went quiet, but I'm back here. So, All right. Um, thank you, Linda, for that, uh, that report. And um, so back to you. Well, I wondered what uh, questions that you have lined up out of, uh, out of this specific interview, because it's so fascinating how many people who have had military service or an aerospace service that at some point they have had some, we'll say, interaction or experience that convinces them for the rest of their life that what they were dealing with were other intelligences, not human, with other technologies. This uh, tonight is in that category, and it is what I am trying to share with everyone. And I would be very interested to see if we will have others who will come forward because of uh, Mr. Engler being willing to talk about this tonight. I have to call him back. Well, Hi, Linda. it's a one-sided, so far, one-sided. We can't get past. Go ahead, Ian. Uh, try to go into questions and let's see if this uh, process will remain uh, audible. <laughs> Gosh, it's like a comedy me. routine. Are you there, Ian? Yeah. Are you hearing me okay? Now, again, I keep my, I'll sit on my hand so Linda, I don't can touch you hear it. Me? I can hear you now. Okay, yep, let's go for it then. Uh, there's comparisons about the footage of UFO landing at Holloman Air Force Base, which was allegedly uh, happened in May 1971. Uh, filmmaker Robert Emmenegger um, apparently were, was reporting on this previously. Uh, perhaps you can comment on that yes. one as well. Oh, yes, he and I have talked about what happened in great depth. I have also talked with other people who were there who knew the biologist who was one of the people that they introduced to one of the live beings. And I have always thought that one of the most interesting parts of my discussion with Robert Emmenegger and Alan Sandler, uh, they did a, uh, the documentary, uh, was that they, uh, the beings, when I asked them if the being that they had distributed in their book, and then I think later in the documentary, that had a ropey headdress, had a large beaked nose, the pupils were drawn vertically like you would a cat, was this literal? And Robert Emmenegger told me that he watched the sketch artist doing the sketch of that being at Holloman Air Force Base by holding up the original 16 millimeter film that was taken on five different cameras. On, I had April 26, 1964 as the date. And that Robert Emmenegger watched the, uh, the illustrator hold up the 16 millimeter film against light and sketch right from it and said this was literal, this was the being. Well, jump forward three or four decades, and that matches what we have come to know as the Ronald Reagan presidential briefing on the five different extraterrestrial types, starting with the Eben, extraterrestrial biological entity, going to the Arkeloid, A-R, I believe it's Q-U-L-O-I-D, might be a C in there, archeloid, and how were they described? Large-nosed, beak-nosed, and a head coming up. Uh, so that was fascinating to me that what seems to fit, and uh, Emmenegger and I talked about this at some length, if the Anunnaki were a real extraterrestrial civilization that came from another solar system, maybe even from another galaxy, and that they had a, a desire to be here on this planet for whatever reasons, they would have brought the technology of an advanced civilization, and how were they described, and how were they 
presented in history, it came in the carvings of limestone. Wow, you can't get more firm than that. And here they are, the ropey headdresses. If you look at some of the uh, carvings, and Shamash was their god from the sun, and he has the ropey headdress is, and has a rod. And so many of the so-called Anunnaki higher authorities had this rod. Well, jump back to Holloman Air Force Base. Uh, Robert Emmenager told me that one of the reasons that they had that black rod in the hand of the large-nosed, beaked, uh, spiral-headed being that came out of a craft and met with some of the Americans, that it had a rod. The rod, when you look at the rod that is drawn in the uh, Holloman Air Force Base sketch having to do with the book and the documentary that Alan Sandler and Robert Emmenager did, it is holding this rod. And how did our government learn from an ET that what this rod does? It is point neutralized gravity, that the rods can be pointed at anything, any mass, and neutralize gravity, and that this is how the pyramids and various things were made, and that this would then, if all of these data pieces that I have uh, discussed now, that I talked about with Robert Emmenager, who said, Linda, you need to study Assyrian history. Specifically, he said, Assyrian history. And that it was related to the being or beings that met with members of uh, our government or military and a biologist out in Holloman Air Force Base in what I thought was 1964. So I think it all happened. I think that the evidence is in some huge, huge, uh, whether it's the, the government has it in trunks or in wall, like libraries, I have no idea. But I think that everything I've just said to you was backed up for me by Alan Sandler and Robert Emmenager. And they're the ones who did the book and the documentary long ago. What? Uh, yeah, George Sankey says in the chat, uh, Linda, do these reports of UFO landings in the 1960s at United States Air Force bases coincide with the start of the agreements, negotiations between humans and non-human intelligences? And if so, what were the agreements? I don't have any hard evidentiary information. I only have anecdotal. No one has ever shown me an agreement, but they have talked to me about having seen an agreement that uh, President Dwight D. Eisenhower signed. But as soon as you say that, you get into so much garbled aspects that I think that the government has done on purpose over and over and over again, so that there is no clear track to witnesses, there's no clear track to the hard evidentiary material that we need. I have Personally, I have no doubt that there was a treaty that was somehow negotiated between President Eisenhower and then the next question, was it a uh, gray type, an archeloid type? Um, was it a Nordic? That is actually uh, the type that I have been said more in the last 10 years, that it was a Nordic, not a gray, but Again, I don't have anything that's evidentiary. But the treaty with Pres that President Eisenhower allegedly negotiated has the aspects that people today say the government would never, ever, ever let the public know because they negotiated the right of an extraterrestrial civilization to take a certain number of animals around the planet for their sustenance and for their genetic manipulation. And I am 
implying and now saying animal mutilations are part of that agreement. Then the question is, would a president of the United States have also done as part of a treaty that included animals and the right to harvest a certain percentage of animals? Would there have been language about the harvesting of sperm and eggs from Homo sapiens sapien around this planet, which has definitely been happening for a very long time? I don't have any evidentiary material that that was in an agreement, but you can't help but ask because I've been told that the animal mutilations were part of an agreement. Well, as Mr. Engler answered tonight in my question of why, why the strict policies of lies and denials decade after decade after decade. And I think his answer probably is correct. Fear, fear inside of people in the Washington DC community, representatives, some elected, some appointed, that since World War II, they've all been wrestling with what they knew and know now. We are not alone in this universe. That during World War II, we became acquainted with the fact that there were a variety of different species that seemed to be involved in that war and that there were technologies that we saw for the first time that we wanted. And today, 80 some years later, where the technology, the experiences with UFOs and ETs by people in the military or intel leading up to Mr. Engler is one of probably a thousand such reports if we all had the truth. And how ironic that on this Wednesday night of July 19th, 2023, that we are supposed to have some kind of an event one week from now in the last Wednesday of July of 2023 in which it is supposed to be some kind of a hearing that is going to begin a process, allegedly, in which they will, I don't know, it says for a day, do they mean that? That only on Wednesday day will there be some kind of discussion? To have a real congressional hearing, we need it to go on for weeks we need people who really have hard, hard information. And we go in to what they're saying that they would like to come out of this new chapter is that they would have a congressional doorway or opening in which there could be now a, a formalized ability for congressional representatives in certain committees to be able to go through a door to the Defense Department, the Pentagon, the intel agencies, and say, we want these documents, and that somehow this will open up. And it just feels to me like it's the same thing over and over and over again. And that where we felt like we were moving forward with some inertia and energy with uh, uh, David Gersh and maybe a couple of other voices, all of that seems to have been stuck in some kind of, look, we can only go so far, so we don't want to hear from them anymore. Uh, now we need to go a new direction. Now, without what I have always prayed, I would live long enough to see and hear person after person after person after person telling the truth in a huge congressional hearing in which everything would be laid out. That's what we need. I think that it is so important to switch from lies and denial to truth. We're already in a rough, terribly rough decade. We still don't know what all is going to happen to this planet. We're all shocked by how heat 
is causing terrible death and problems. And we're only at 2023. And that controlled remote viewing that I have shared with you, uh, I think in the first year that I did the earthfiles.com, I shared with you a interview that I had done with Lynn Buchanan, who was in the controlled remote viewer group uh, uh, under the Defense Intelligence Agency and the CIA back at the end of uh, 1989 to early 1990, I believe. And that in the controlled remote viewing for the government, not for the public, it was leaked later, that they ask about the future and that the remote viewers got that 2020 to 2030 was going to be a bucking horse decade and that there would be a tremendous amount of problems and a great reduction in human population. So we're in this decade. Why can't we be introduced to the ETs that I understand, such as the Tall Whites and at least some of the Nordics, who want to help us because they have a vested interest in this Earth and this evolutionary experiment that we apparently are. If there ever has been a time where there was this much consciousness on the Earth, for that consciousness to be told the whole truth and that there could be a legitimate brand new landscape in which homo sapien and advanced beings that don't want to hurt us, they want to help us and it would be set, the tone, the agreement would be on that level. Maybe then we could get help for some of these horrible problems that we are definitely not prepared for just the temperature to be this consistently high in so many parts of the world so suddenly, and we are not out of July yet. What happens in August and September and the Canadian fires for two months and now going and continuing, and we have today, we've had the smoke from the Canadian fires here in Albuquerque yet again. Why can't our government with their allies open up the entire extraterrestrial civilization is here in this solar system and beyond in the context that we are on a planet now that needs help. Why can't that be done? So, Ian, that's, that's what my mind filled up with as I have been reading about the upcoming so-called next Wednesday something and talking with Richard Eglund and so many others who know, they have known because they worked where ETs and UFOs were. Well, Linda, Christina Ledesma Eminis says, exciting things happening and more and more truth coming out day by day. It's amazing and crazy times. And Hello Ali says, uh, will Linda be in DC next week for the hearings? Um, so she wonders if you're going to be actually there, but I know you, that you're not planning on going I'm, there. I'm planning on doing an Earth Files uh, uh, podcast, well, becomes a podcast, my live Earth Files. I plan to do that next Wednesday. I have one fascinating show that I'm already working on, but depending upon what might open up between now and next Wednesday concerning this, I might uh, be able to add something. But don't you have the feeling that a year ago we thought there was going to be for the first time some honesty? And remember the hearing where they weren't even answering honestly about all of the Minuteman missile uh, intrusions by UFOs and were acting like they didn't know anything about it. If we get that same kind of replay Wednesday, then it's incumbent upon all of us who want the truth and feel we should be sharing the truth to keep trying as hard as we can. This is hard work to do this weekly. But my God, we are talking about the existential issues affecting 
humanity and all animal life forms on this planet now. De whether you're talking about the sun or whether you're talking about uh, volcanoes or whatever, we're, we're in a what appears to be a, a rough time. And on the other side, if we get honesty, we get truth, we could be introduced to advanced intelligences who might be able to help us. It could be an entirely new dawn for Earth and humanity. And that's what I keep praying for. Okay. Well, yeah, that's what Peter 7966 in the chat says. Why hearings now is something up. Does the government feel the need to disclose now? And George Sankey also says, uh, do you believe that the government is aware of an impeding, undeniable world event that will happen in the near future, hence the seeming push and rush for disclosure? It is a question that I have been asking sources. I have hundreds of emails asking the same questions. And if you go outside of political rhetoric, in which we're drowning in political rhetoric, we're drowning in political strategies. Who can get who in this corner? Who, who can slam this person uh, down? And that's, to me, everything is, is becoming so harsh and so dangerous uh, that it's, uh, it's alarming. And the the issue of what could be coming. This is my 44th year of trying to get to the bottom of animal mutilations, human abductions, uh, which ETs have which motives, are from what solar system, have been here before, have been here the longest, uh, all of it. And yet what it feels like right now is that the internecine warfare in the Pentagon and the Department of Defense and all of the issues about keeping everything from Russia and uh, enemies. If you've got this very complex chess game. It's at work 24-7 all the time. And that it's like they allowed three or four weeks in which it felt like, wow, they're they're really going to start allowing some people in military and intel to start telling the truth. And it just evaporates and turns into more internecine warfare and sort of a sense that we're in some kind of a game and that the people who know how to play the game are in control. The rest of us who just want to know the facts and the truth and get back on a planet in which there are not murders every single day fighting over political issues. It's, to me, it feels depressing. This, this whole thing feels very depressing. And if we could start having honesty real honesty with real photographs and films that aren't cut down to three seconds to show something that can be said on the news, but that's it. We know that Suitland, Maryland alone, down underground, as I understand it, has acres and acres of files being kept for the Central Intelligence Agency since its creation on September 18th, 19. 47. Truman created the CIA deliberately after the first week of July 1947 crash or crashes, depending upon which version of everybody's stories is true, but at least the one that got on the Roswell Daily Record. That one is significant because it was captured through journalism. And it has lived there all of these many years. What happens if whatever this day on next Wednesday, who's going to be talking? Is it going to be to Congressman Schiff 
and others on the committee in an open, genuine, real, congressional hearing of Q&A? Or is it going to be completely scripted, all agreed behind? You don't want to talk to this person, and the reason that they don't want a lot of people to talk to is because they actually have a lot of information. And so part of the game, it seems to me, is they're trying to deflect from people who have a lot of information and go with people they can control. And it's disheartening. So if you, if all of you, and feel a hug from me for we've 245,000, if all of you who are in the United States could phone, could text, could email, type hard letters to all of your Senate and House sides in the state that you're in and start asking, demanding that we as a citizenry in a government of, by, and for the people should know everything that the government of the United States knows about extraterrestrial civilizations, for God's sake. That's what we're talking about. What is the true nature of the universe that we are in, that we are seeing with the Webb telescope, black holes and stars that go all the way back to five, uh, half a, it's 500 million, half a billion, and they're probably going to go back further. What kind of universe are we in? If it is a hologram, it's being projected from another dimension, another universe. Who's doing the projection? It's an amazing, the revolution that we are in. But if truth and honesty don't prevail, what have we accomplished? Okay, I will try to smile now. <laughs> and I will try to get out of my depressed state. <laughs> go ahead, Ian. This will, che this will cheer you up. Let's go to the super chats. People have been very generous this evening and, uh, and as well as contributing to the chats. They've also contributed to us as well. So thank you to Moonbird, Whisper of Love, Terry D, Earth Angel, Sir Dean, Caroline Boyce, Yin Yang Glow, Mr. Catfish, Rene Martin, Juan Arlini, Tad Mailer. Laura R. and Processed Meat. Wow. I'm sorry if I've missed anybody out, but there was so many wow. in the chat tonight. Well, thank you very, very much. But I, I want to say, I'm always, I, I am a person who, um, I really have to say to you guys what I actually feel. And I feel a certain kind of sense that we're moving into desolation. Desolation physically, mentally, spiritually, emotionally, on a planet and where we have an insane war, that the food supply may be affected because of one man named Putin in Russia can go like this and stop the grain coming out of at least grain out of Russia to other countries that had not been interrupted till now. That at the very time where the heat of the earth is going to be a major factor now add food and starvation. It just, I, I don't know, you all tell me, do you feel that there is a really truly dangerous point soon upon us, which comes back to the question you ask in a way, Ian, and I was gonna circle around and say that what abductees themselves keep writing to me now they think there's going to be an event from the sun that would f uh, fall into the category of the micronova. And one of the uh, statements that was made to me, I think of three, four years ago, was that there was a worry about, uh, or that ETs had signaled that there could be a micronova from our sun in the year 2023 and perhaps after and this was what I remember being shocked at hearing for the first time about three years ago, and that the prominences from the sun would actually, this was the word, hit the earth and scorch. Now that happened in the 1800s 
in Canada in the famous Carrington event. It was a strong, 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 I don't remember the X factor. We're, we're, we're way high in our X factors on the solar flares on the sun right now. But that one in Carrington sounds to some degree like the one that has been described to me three years ago, that the sun could interact to the point that it could cause fires. And why is that just like, oh, God, no? Because we're already, Canada is now in going into the third month of more fires with the smoke coming all the way down here. And what happens? All of the tinder that is now developing in so many places on our planet. If something happens from the sun and it ignites everything or ignites a lot that is very dry, what could be coming down the pike that would be literally uncontrollable? Is the government of the United States or any government on planet Earth prepared for global fires? And we haven't even talked about the possibility of tactical nuclear devices that Putin keeps uh, using as his thump his chest. So I am feeling that this is an extremely dangerous time. I, I have not felt like this for maybe never. And it shouldn't just stay in rhetoric. We should get some honest answers so that people, at least humans, whether you're in the government or not, or intel or not, that humans are given some kind of honest insight into what the hell is coming down. I really feel strongly about this. So... Okay, I'm going to swing back. I've gone from depression to anger. <laughs> Ian, <laughs> I promise I will stay on a more positive note. But it, I'm being honest. That's what I am. I am being honest. Sure. Let's remind people we've got Simone Kerr, for example, says, how can I send you the video evidence I have had for the last two months uh, of UAPs above my house? I have proof. I send it to earthfarms at earthfarms.com. Let's remind people to do that. Okay, and t so you will all know, no matter what photos or videos are sent, I have like a, a screening process that I go through uh, initially. And then uh, Whitley Strieber and I and a few others have worked uh, with Dan Drayson, who is a superb uh, an analyzer of video and film and things graphic separating the truth of what's real and what's unreal. So any videos, any photos that are sent to me, I contact Dan, and we've been doing this for, I think, 25 years, and he gives me analysis. So it goes through a process of somebody that I know has probably seen more photographs, more videos, more uh, film, and is a great analyzer. So if I, if you send this to me and Dan comes back with a report, it's X, Y, and Z, supported by whatever his analysis is, that would be something that I would then come back and say, may I have your permission to uh, show at the Earth Files and we would share something that would pass his muster. But I have never, ever received film photographs, or anything that should be evidentiary and just put it out. I've never done that. I have always gone to Dan. So I would do the same thing in this situation, which I hope makes you all feel better, that I really do try to vet. Um, but working against it is, whatever is going on on the planet now, it seems like that more and more people are getting their cell phones out and recording. So who knows where this is leading? Go ahead, Ian. I'll, I know I, I, we, went, we started a little bit late, so I'll do two or three more questions. Okay, well, we've got some personal experiences here. Don K. Johnson says, in the late 1990s, I worked at TRW in Hawthorne, now Northrop. 
I had to have film processes and pic uh, processes and picture. Uh, I had to have an escort through photo area to the lab door. All the cubicles had curtains shut. Yes, the there could be an entire documentary about the extraordinary levels of secrecy, especially underground, uh, in which you and I, and when, remember Celestine, her husband was, this was at Edwards as well, and how they went in that elevator, he was her uh, husband, and he wanted her to see something specific at Edwards, and remember how they, uh, she had to walk with him, and then they went into, uh, uh, and got in an elevator, and the elevator went down deeply, 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 deeply. She couldn't believe it. Did, trying to estimate how many stories they went down underground. And then the story, uh, we shared it from Celestine on Earth Files a couple of years ago, that he shows her a deep underground facility where when she looks through a window, what was she seeing, Ian? You can answer. Well, she said she she looked through the window, she turned around, she spun around uh, in complete shock because she saw a reptilian with an apparatus around its mouth. Uh, she mouthed to her husband, she said, what is that? And he said, well, mouth back to her, we are working with it. We, I remember those words. Right. We are working with it. Yes. So. So, and, and also, bear in mind as well, we followed up that program with somebody else who had also been in an elevator underground at that same facility. Yeah. There have been many. There, it, the list goes on and on. And uh, I extend... Um, to all of you who may have your own experiences with UFOs, ETs, uh, all of the security, like Mr. Engler, who, who has uh, who sought me out to do this story. For those of you who have a lot of details in your own experiences, working in military, working in aerospace, working in medicine, technology that has brought you into face-to-face um, -face or first-hand information. That is what I would like to be able to share more of because it feels like, and I guess I should throw that to the, our whole audience tonight, it feels like to me that where we thought that we were actually going to get that big headline, we're not alone in this universe, and that this year would come and we would finally get truth. It feels like all they did was just change the script a little bit and that right now there may be even more players set up to lie and misinform. I just can't believe that this is where things seem to be headed. So for anybody out there who wants to help people know the truth. Uh, you can email me or proton mail me or hard mail me and we'll try to do segments with or without your real voice, with or without your real name or background. I can do it either way as long as I have evidentiary material that you, the person, is who they say that they are, which means DD-214s and other certificates, which I don't have to show, but I need to see. So, Ian, um, is there a cheery note <laughs> in the chat <laughs> that we well, can okay, go out it's... on and you can read it? <laughs> I want to save this one for the end anyway. It's from Augustus Wetzel in the uh, Super Chats this evening, uh, who says, if truth is revealed, extraterrestrials exist and are here, what do you think is more likely to happen? The extraterrestrials come forward and reveal themselves, or do they go further into hiding? Both. I am convinced that both hiding and public are the options among the ETs that deal with this planet, because we're dealing 
with hostile, we're dealing with neutral, we're dealing with friendly. All three are in the ingredients of the non-humans that have been on this planet for a very long time and are here now through our solar system and beyond. There's no question in my mind, at least those three categories. And that treaty where we started tonight in Q&A, the treaty that President Eisenhower would have signed. Personally, I think that President Eisenhower was a really good human being who had a soul and he would have been trying to the best of his ability to help in a very complicated and what they must have seen as potentially dangerous. And by then, when he did the treaty, it, at least what I have been told is that during World War II, our government, that's when we discovered, we knew the extraterrestrials in advanced craft that we didn't understand all kinds of things were happening in World War II. And that the residue of all of the strict policies of denial and lies to cover it all up is what some of us have been hoping would finally be lifted this year and that we would start finally evolving as a civilization of many on an honest note in which our survival on a planet where we, out of ignorance in many cases, have done things which are making our present and our future way more dangerous to the evolution and survival of humanity. Wouldn't it be, have been wonderful? Could it still be wonderful if the beings that consistently are described as at least spiritual and that whatever they want, that the tall whites are not here to harm us, the tall whites are here for reasons that are still not quite clear, but that if they had not been helping us, this could have been uh, even more dangerous. So if we already have some that have a vested interest, maybe because they are the genetic manipulators that created the line of standing up uh, primates on this planet in the first place. And we happen to be the, the latest model. That could be part of what the tall whites who live 850 years and supposedly their civilization is millions and millions and millions, billions of years. There are others and that Ronald Reagan, another president, this is so important to remember this. If Eisenhower did a treaty Reagan in 1981 was given that briefing at Camp David by the CIA, NSA, DIA, and they told him about the five extraterrestrial civilizations. And that I know that Emmett Chappelle, a biophysicist, is the one who gave the names. And that those names were laid out to President Ronald Reagan by CIA, NSA, DIA because the way our government is supposed to work is that the president uh, elected by people so that the people have influence on the type of government through voting, but there is a huge gulf, a gigantic disconnect between the elected world, the voting world and the 17 agencies of intelligence that they would argue that their goals are to keep the United States protected. But they are the ones who know the most about the extraterrestrials. And if we have 17 huge agencies who have all the information, but what we get as the population in the United States of America that is supposed to be a government of, by, and for the people, and that the representatives that are going to have this meeting next Wednesday, if it is more farce, 
what kind of government and country are we in? That to me is much scarier than the questions about the ETs. This could be, for the first time in a long time, a moment where those 17 agencies and the government and the representatives and the people of the United States of America could all come together in the same square of intent to tell the truth about what is known for real about other extraterrestrial civilizations and what our human representatives, whether in the United States or other countries, because a lot of other countries are involved as well, what can we do to finish out this year and the rest of this dangerous decade collaborating with tall whites and doing it publicly, collaborating with some Nordics and doing it publicly, while the whole world needs to be educated about these centuries and centuries of other consciousness that have been here, are here, are out. That would be exciting. That would be thrilling if we all were guaranteed that we were finally going to learn the truth, all of it. The bad, the ugly, the inspirational, the beautiful, the infinite. On that note, I'm going to say agape hug to all of you everywhere around this planet that is struggling so hard, that if you concentrate on trying so hard to say we need frequencies that stay true. We need true frequencies more than anything. Maybe we can shift the future. I love you guys. Turn on closed captions for YouTube videos by clicking the white CC button on the lower right. The default language for Linda's videos is English. If you would like to see the captions in another language, click on the white settings button next to the CC button. Select subtitle CC and then select auto translate. I don't have to put them in select a language uh, bind them anywhere they love and the captions will now appear in that language sort of gone through and they will hold their heads I never had a cat do that before and they'll pull against the comb helping me get out snarls and I think it's the best they've ever been <laughs>